Hey, hello everybody. Welcome back for another video. Hope you're all doing well and that you're all having an absolutely fantastic day. And without any further ado, uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, this is going to be another very weird video, I promise you. Uh, for some reason, uh, for those of you who didn't notice before, the vast majority of the news over the course of the last two weeks has mainly been uh, Bitcoin spot ETF news. And since I think people have gotten used to the fact that we have it, we know why prices are going down. For those of you who missed it, it appears to be because of Grayscale. Uh, Grayscale has an enormous amount of Bitcoin. People are selling off their previous Bitcoin trust and therefore prices go down. You sell, price go down. So I think people are now looking for like the next thing that could make a lot of sense or what the answer could be for things within the cryptocurrency space. And what we're currently getting now is a lot of like analytical stuff and people talking about the nature of Bitcoin and exactly how it's going to go and where things might be in the near future. This one was incredibly popular. Fidelity's director of global macro, his name is Jurian Timmer. That's Julian without the L's, replace them with R's. He's been in the news a lot. I want to say the last year or so. Has provided what they're calling a critical perspective on Bitcoin's trajectory. Analyzing it through the lens of network growth and of scarcity features. Timmer points to the foundational principle that Bitcoin's value is closely correlated with the expansion of its network, a concept reflected in what is called Metcalfe's Law, which posts that the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of its users. This is why we normally, if you've been paying attention, see a quite a bit of news quite often about the amount of people who are using Bitcoin. How many people are on the network? Other people tend to, or I would say the vast majority of people, believe that the price is the most important. The actual thing is the usage. Is it being used by how many people? Is it once a week? Is it every day during the week? How much money is flowing through the actual network? How many new people do we have entering the cryptocurrency space every single day? That's why I believe, I want to say November, we had news that apparently there were around, I think, 300,000 new wallet addresses on one day, which shows an exponential amount of network growth for Bitcoin. He said, in my view... The price of Bitcoin is driven by the size and growth of its network, which in turn is driven by its scarcity features, the stock to flow, and real rates, the Fed's policy. As the chart shows, Bitcoin's network is growing in line with a standard power regression curve, and it kind of continues on as basically he's talking about the movements of the market are the same as they've always been, and you can see a lot of the patterns uh, from other money markets as well, and apparently, regardless of the price movements that we have, if prices are going down and it's terrifying people and or prices might be going up and people become euphoric, it's part of any money market's organic growth, and it's something that we simply have to actually go through. I don't have any Fed news here, but the Fed news recently has been that uh, it looks like they might start uh, reducing interest rates around quarter two. That is to say, I guess that would be, is it April, like April 1st or like the end of March or somewhere around there? Um, and a lot of people are quite optimistic. We have had news that if they do lower rates, it could potentially have a very positive effect on the cryptocurrency market and also on stock markets as well. But at least from what we've heard, it looks like they're only going to be lowering interest rates by 0.75%. That is to say, three-fourths of 1% over the course of the year testing things out as they do not want to drop things immediately back to where they were before and have the market go through all the trouble that we previously were going through. And here's the actual Bitcoin adoption curve right here. 
with prices as far as, and I mean in essence, that is that we need to struggle. We need to have prices go up. We need to wash people out, have new people back in the market, and it's just a cycle curve. We should have actually gone a lot higher in price over the course of 2020 and 2021, but you all remember what happened. The adoption curve for Bitcoin supports this theory, showcasing a consistent power law distribution over time. This suggests not just growth, but a predictable sustained increase that closely mirrors the S-curve typical of new technology adoption. The chart shared by Timmer illustrates this progression, plotting the number of non-zero Bitcoin addresses. I hate, I hate that term so much and I don't know why. It's something over the last couple of years that I've really learned to hate. The idea of non-zero, like so like addresses that are holding Bitcoin, instead of just saying the number of addresses holding Bitcoin, you say non-zero. And like it, it, it drives me absolutely insane. Like the like the amount of addresses that have non-zero Bitcoin, and it's like, can you just say Bitcoin addresses? The fit is compelling, suggesting that despite volatility, Bitcoin's adoption is not merely sporadic, but follows a path anticipated by the models that have charted the course successfully and it continues on like this article goes on for a very long time he talks about scarcity as well and you you kind of get the generalized idea i don't have to go that much further this was very popular i'm not i'm not sure if it was because it had to do with a general state of analytics uh maybe people are looking for uh, other analysts right now who are giving them simply more than price go up price go down kind of thing I don't know necessarily why. Maybe it's a it's a a a, a rerun or, or something like that. It's not the word I'm looking for at all. That people need to be uh, uh, reminded. I was like rerun. No, people need to be reminded of what Bitcoin actually is and know that there's scarcity. That the the adoption rate continues to go up. Literally every single day, countries have adopted it. But once again, the vast majority of people tend to just care for the news about the price. So you get lost in it. You forget how far that we've come. You forget that this thing is has been around for 15 years and how like broad it is that is around the globe. And anyway, so cool. Um, Mr. Jurian Timmer is back in the news once again, quite popular just because he basically said, what all of you knew in the back of your heads, that Bitcoin is quite resilient. People keep using it regardless of where the prices might be and how they might go down. More people are still adopting it. And also, just in case you keep missing the news, uh, the amount of crypto that all the ETF holders are holding continues to rise on a very dramatic basis. Uh, they are going to hold an egregious amount of Bitcoin. I, I mean, first of all, they already do but even more in the very near future. And I personally am interested to see exactly how much Bitcoin they're going to have by the 1st of March, because I think it's going to be a bit of a doozy. That's the Bitcoin's still doing fine news. And yeah, let's move on. And I guess like 2.0 of this news, I'm, I'm not, I'll, I'll explain in one second. Tether from from Tether, has apparently purchased more Bitcoin at the end of the fourth quarter, buying an additional 8,888 more Bitcoin for roughly around 380 million U.S. dollars. This was reported by The Block. An address associated with the company shows Bitcoin holdings of 66,465 Bitcoin, which makes them the 11th holder, the 11th largest holder, of Bitcoin according to the ranking by Dune Analytics. In an effort to shift away from cash and cash-like assets such as U.S. Treasury bonds backing their stablecoin, Tether announced in May of 2023 that they would start allocating 15% of their profits into Bitcoin that we already knew. In the latest attestation report, Tether now holds 72.6. That's a lot. That's an egregious amount. That's why not many people are bothering them anymore. That makes sense. Jeez. Tether is holding $72.6 billion in government bonds and $1.7 billion in Bitcoin, among other allocations. 
The company has long been under the microscope for the quality of their assets, and that's basically because a lot of other companies are trying to do exactly what Tether has been doing. They want to create their own stablecoin. But you have to make sure to throw dirt and mud in the face of your competitors, Tether, as you do not want them to succeed. Uh, in the earlier days, we heard news, all lies, that Tether... Uh, didn't have the money for their stablecoin and that it was backed by nothing and people were talking about where all this tether ended up coming from and then tether showed us their first uh, receipts as it were and they held a large amount of um, I think it was foreign currency air quotes they had a lot of different allocations into different things but I guess if they moved a lot of their assets into 72.6 billion dollars worth of government bonds this is probably why we don't hear any more complaining about them because it was mainly, it was mainly, it was mainly only uh, the U.S. government and other U.S. Uh, institutions who were complaining uh, that Tether wasn't exclusively holding just U.S. dollars. Uh, so the new report is that in general, we heard, I mean, like this was like two weeks ago, we heard that Tether bought more Bitcoin, but that was another like amount. Now we heard it was another 8,888 and they now have a uh, 1.7 billion dollars worth of Bitcoin so we will be hearing about this again I think in the next eight or so weeks as they end up buying uh, even more Bitcoin because they're buying it I believe every single quarter 15% of their profits uh, they are also going to be a uh, massive force in the future if Bitcoin does ever actually end up going to uh, a million a million plus dollars per coin. So yeah, um, that's the extra tether news. This was also floating around as well. And yeah, institutions are 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 still still buying. That's what that's what they do. Let's move on. In unexpected news, we haven't heard about this in a very long time. Algorand is back in the news. It says Algorand is making an interesting play to be a more functional blockchain. According to John Allen Woods Algorand. What? Is that his name? John Allen Woods Algorand? Ah, there's, they're, they're, they're missing some kind of punctuation. I think his name is John Allen Woods, who was Algorand CTO. There, I was like, his name is Algorand? Oh my gosh. Four new Algorand updates are coming in 2024. They apparently have a brand new roadmap. In terms of transactions per second, yeah, his name is John Woods. There we go. Uh, wait, isn't that the place in London? Is it, Sa is it St. John's Wood? I'll shut up. John Woods said Algorand has now become um, approximately 10% faster. Uh, the protocol is bound to experience increased network performance. Consequently, this would translate to higher throughput and lower block times to make the protocol generally more optimized. Um, I'm getting really tired. I'll tell you right now. I'm getting really tired of people not writing how many transactions per second. Uh, maybe I'm just completely old school, but it makes a lot more sense when blockchains say, we do three transactions per second. We do 15. We do 5,000. This really weird thing where everyone's like, well, that, that, that doesn't really count anymore because the transactions are in blocks and the blocks are linked together and then the links are one big transaction and it's, I, I, don't, I don't want that. Like I, I want actual numbers and figures because a lot of blockchains get by quite easily by simply stating, well, ours is 10% faster. From what? What are your metrics? What are the numbers? Were, were you guys doing 500 before and now it's 550? What's the actual, this entire like grouping thing and using it as an excuse to say that your blockchain is a lot faster and it's like you still need numbers and metrics. That's what I said before a long time ago when I was talking about the Lightning Network. Everyone keeps talking about how the Lightning Network will eventually be able to do 1 million transactions per second. And I was like, based off of what? How many actual uh, connections in the Lightning Network do we need to get to the mathematical number of 1 million? Like, is the Lightning Network, like, that's what I also think would really increase adoption because we have a lot of people who are uh, using the Lightning Network, opening up payment channels. If we knew mathematically that we weren't at a million, but we had news that mathematically we have 42,000 transactions per second, that would cause a lot of people to go use Lightning, but no one shares numbers anymore. It's just like, we're, we're faster. We're doing better. We can lump transactions better. It's like, okay, sure, why not? This upgrade, 
will cause block times to average less than three seconds. That tells me nothing. In the long run, developers and builders will enjoy the flexibility that comes with the efficiency. Fantastic. Then there's also something called Algo Kit 2.0. A comprehensive toolkit with the integration of one of the world's most popular programming languages. They're integrating Python. This move is directed at gaining widespread adoption amidst Algorand's consistency English. Consistency towards technical excellence. Sure, why not? They'll be able to build on top of it. And so John Wood, he this is a guy. He said there's a gigant gargantuan amount of change coming to Algorand. Um, dynamic round times. Algorand is now 10% faster. It's the Algo Kit 2.0 in quarter one of this year. Uh, builders on top of it. Fantastic. As highlighted, Algo Kit 2.0. The next Algorand update features consensus incentivization. The protocol plans to incentivize participation through proof of stake. All block producers will be rewarded for their work. Isn't that how it always Anyone who is a block producer and or validating, aren't you normally rewarded for your work? And this will hopefully trigger a surge in the amount of Algorand that is being staked. Okay, so I assume you have to have a certain amount of Algorand to be able to be a validator, but they don't say exactly how much you need. And I know someone knows it by heart. I'm, I'm happy for you that you know those numbers, but I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. Also... It would grow the number of consensus nodes in the network and in turn improve the security and decentralization. The fourth Algorand update highlighted by the firm CTO is a peer-to-peer -peer network. Okay. Algorand is leaving behind its relay structure where consensus nodes produce blocks in a permissionless manner and moving on to a peer-to-peer -peer gossip network? Is this a TV show? What is this? This, this, is a very, this is very similar to the structured, leveraged by Bitcoin and other networks. Here, the flow of data is directly between consensus nodes. Ultimately, this is going to make the network more viable. Okay, so as we have it right now, it looks like um, Algorand is getting like four different updates. I was I was a little shocked because this was not very popular news. Normally, any time that any coin ends up back in the news saying that they they're going to be doing something cool in the future, it tends to make uh, quite popular news. However, um, yeah, we haven't had anything from Algorand in a long time. Uh, it was Algorand. What are the other ones? Uh, not the metaverse coins. Uh, there were two other coins that were very similar to Algorand a couple of years ago. I think that Algorand is also the company who has partnered with um, has partnered with FIFA. I think Algorand is with FIFA, and FIFA was putting um, I think tickets and NFTs on top of the Algorand blockchain. But that was like 2021, 2022. Haven't heard a word since then. So cool. Algorand is back in the news, and they're going to be updating. Literally what I told all of you before at the end of the year, every single coin, every single chain probably has a lot of updates and upgrades that they're trying to do. The issue always is, is they usually tend to wait for the halving. Whenever there's halvings coming up, we know that prices tend to normally move up as well. And altcoins usually benefit if they release news, typically as we move towards the having and usually as we get to the having they will usually announce like wait like a week or two before the actual having it's going to get absolutely insane the amount of news the amount of updates the amount of upgrades the amount of coins talking about that they're back in action and this is going to happen i also wouldn't be surprised at all if we end up hearing from eos again because they have been extremely silent if those for those of you who weren't here uh long story short these people made $4 billion talking about what they were going to do and how they were going to become the next Ethereum. They also went completely silent. Sometime last year, some of the people came forward talking about that they were going to rebrand and make everything completely beautiful and amazing. And da, 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 since then, not a word. That's the Algorand news. Mm hmm. Let's move on. Look who's also back in the news, the Terra Classic community. 
It says, recently has something to cheer about. That's a very weird sentence. Following revelations about the amount of Luna Classic and USTC tokens that were burned over the past week. During that period, a large amount of tokens were burned. That's not a number. Something which could possibly affect the coin's price. In a Twitter post, Alex Crypto Bull, a member of the Terra community, brought to the community's attention that 700 million Luna Classic tokens, and I assume the other one is 230,000 of their stablecoin tokens were burned last week. Uh, the Terra ecosystem has had to intensify its burns ever since the Terra Luna crash in a bid to revive the Luna Classic and USTC tokens. So far, that's a lot. How many coins are there? So far, 94.31 billion Terra Luna Classic tokens have been burned and 1.5 billion of their stablecoin. What? Is that a real number? How many Terra Luna Classics are there? If they've burned 94.31 billion coins, how do they burn 1.5 billion of their stablecoin? Doesn't that seem a bit odd to anyone out there? Imagine you as a company had control over one, wh wh whoever has control over the USTC tokens or who's minting them. What is the, what is the, is there a redemption process as you are burning stable coins? I would assume many of them have to be backed by something. Were they simply backed by Terra Luna Classic? Were they backed by US dollars? Were they backed by treasury bills? Were they backed by real estate? Were they backed by gold? I feel like incentive wise i'm much more inclined myself to simply hold on to my 1.5 billion dollars of stable coins as opposed to burning it to try and get the coins price to go up by like one cent okay uh all these coins have been burned and wiped out from circulation since the 13th of may of 2022 oh i remember that day that was a crazy day when that entire thing happened oh boy yeah um, as part of their incentive or initiative, the community at one time had to vote on a proposal that, if passed, would have seen 800 million of their stable coins being burned. The proposal was, however, rejected due to legal concerns. So they could burn 1.5 billion, but they can't burn 800 million? Very confused. Uh, we've had a lot of Shiba Inu news. Shiba Inu and Terra Luna Classic were like hand in hand over the course of like a year and a half period every single day the news was just there was nothing about updates or upgrades or new mechanics or this happening it was just how many coins that they could burn uh shiba inu came out as a joke of a joke of a joke and then ended up creating too many coins. The, the project gained popularity. They have their own metaverse. They have their own layer two solutions. They have all these other things. And now they're also trying to burn as many coins as possible in an effort to raise their coins price. Uh, Terra Luna Classic was part of a, an ecosystem, or Terra Luna, forgive me, was part of an ecosystem that a lot of people told me that I should have been looking into over the course of a couple of years ago and I was like no I'm okay and that completely collapsed and then for some reason a day and a half later out of its ashes uh, Terra Luna Classic became a thing and people loved it question mark and now they're trying to burn as many I, it just it just a lot of I don't know people like these coins a lot uh, it seems like one of the main features of the chains is just like destroying as many coins as possible there's been nothing really thrown out there as to what the coins are going to do who what, what they're going to provide who they've partnered with but alas uh yeah look at that and in in one day we got some algorand news and some terra luna classic news i'm pretty sure the other altcoins are on their way as well because that's what always happens and yeah cool fantasticals Let's move on. Also in, sure, why not? This seems completely logical. Asset management firms have apparently had to cut their fees on their Bitcoin exchange traded funds in Europe by over 60% in order to compete with stuff from the United States. We had some really weird 
uh, fee wars that were going on where, I mean, the only person or group who's really lost at this one is kind of Grayscale. Uh, for some reason, Grayscale still has, at least at the time of me making this video, Grayscale still has a 1.5% fee, which no one can understand why they have it. It is incredibly unorthodox to have a fee that high in general. You will typically see fees of 0.9%, 0.85, somewhere ranging around there. You'll usually even see a lot of companies doing like a good 045 it incentivizes you to use their fund over other funds that are out there. <coughs> the problem is, for some reason, Grayscale still has 1.5. The other issue is, is that as we were getting closer to actual acceptance of the ETFs, a number of these companies, the Grayscale, the, the BlackRocks, the Fidelity, excuse me, uh, for some reason, they had fees of around like half of a percent, and then they went all the way down to like 0 0.25, 0 0.3, 0 0.35. And for those of you who did not know, um, Europe and Canada and I believe Australia um, have had Bitcoin ETFs for a number of years. The issue is, is that they were the only ones in the market, so they really didn't have to think about any type of um, competition. And now they do because BlackRock is literally one of their competition now. In an interview with the Financial Times, Gary Buxton... In Vesco's head of ETFs for Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and the Asian Pacific, said many ETF provisors have lowered their fees on their spot Bitcoin ETFs in response to the competitive landscape within the US market. Kathy Woods, ARK Investment Management, initially indicated a 0.8% fee for their spot ETF. Eventually launched with no fees for the first six months or until assets reach $1 billion. I assume that's already the case. They've also been buying their own fund. <gasps> Wouldn't that be really weird if they were tired of the whole first note, like the six months thing? Because we just had news that they're buying like the ARK Invest Management Fund with the ETF has been buying millions of dollars worth of their own ETF. Well, now we probably know that they're probably trying to reach that $1 billion so they can charge people. Weird. BlackRock's investors have, oh, geez, Louise, they have a 0.25% fee. You know how good 0.25% is? That number doesn't even make sense in my mind. Can you, oh my gosh, anyway. With early investors accessing it at... <laughs> With early investors accessing the fund at 0.12% for the first year until assets reach $5 billion. It makes a lot of sense why they had so many people running for their ETFs now. They said the launch of spot Bitcoin ETFs in the United States is helping the crypto market to evolve as the asset class continues to stake a claim for a place in client portfolios. Executives said that the U.S. price wars seem to have settled around 30 basis points, adding that below the threshold, providers may struggle to be profitable unless they attract substantial assets under management like BlackRock. They're not going to, there's a reason why they chose 0 0.12 and 0 0.25 because they know that the money is going to be there. They're going to be, <laughs> going to be just fine. Um, cool. This was also popular news. I'm like, I, I told you, I told you in the beginning, I told you it was going to be a very weird video. I told you the news was going to be all over the place. And I did lightly warn you that the news would have to do with ETFs. I didn't tell you that it would do with ETF fees, but alas, here we are. You made it to the end of the video. Yeah. Very weird time in the cryptocurrency space. It feels like everyone's kind of like walking around in like a fog or something like that. Like no one really knows what to do with themselves. We're not at the previous all-time highs. Uh, the discussion is constantly still around Ethereum and XRP ETFs. A lot of the price predictions uh, from Kathy Wood, from Novogratz, from all these other people of us hitting 100K super fast never really transpired immediately. And therefore, we're now getting a lot of news about like Bitcoin fundamentals and how like Bit Bitcoin's still awesome and all these other things that are going on and... Cool. So uh, people have had to lower their fees. That seems logical because if people, I mean, the, the ones in Europe and I believe Canada were being like used. I think the one in Canada got over like a million, a billion, excuse me, a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin and did not turn any heads because everyone was just waiting 
for Old Man Gensler, which is very depressing. Um, Terra Luna Classic is now burning more coins. Algorand is trying to be relevanter. I don't understand how these... Maybe you can explain to me if you have a project. I don't understand how you could have a project and go silent. It never makes any sense to me. Like, even... This is going to sound completely weird, but it's literally how I think. I remember thinking a number of years ago, there were so many... Um, celebrities and also like singers who were trying to like make comebacks and especially like people who were singing and i remember there was one person i think she had been gone for like nine or ten years and she came back in like this really weird triumphant kind of thing talking about you know my new album and i was like no one's gonna listen to you and then lo and behold no one listened to her she was gone for a decade i i, I maybe it's because i'm so used to making content like literally every day if i was a singer i would make sure that i before I took a break, I made about a good 20 songs. I invited my friends over, other celebrities. I told you it's going to be a weird conversation. I'd make a whole bunch of content. So while I am taking a break, I can still have songs popping up every, you know, two or three times per year. So people still remember my name. You can't just reappear and be like, hey, what's up? What's going on? And this is what a lot of coins tend to do all the time like the market goes up there's like such a huge fervor for them they're releasing non-stop news and then over the course of a two three and a half period we hear nothing from them it's like a lot of these projects if you continued to like release stuff and told people stuff and said hey we have this going on we have these conferences going on we have this new stuff being built on top of it we have this upgrade we have new smart contracts we're integrating with this People would be more, n n not that people aren't in, in, you know, interested in Algorand, but you get what I mean. You can't just disappear. You can't just disappear for a long time, not have any news, and then release news that you have four upgrades and updates over the course of a, a, a two-month period in a couple of months and expect everyone to be like, oh my gosh, let me buy all the Algorand. It's weird, right? It's not just me. Anyway, um, yeah, hope you enjoyed this super weird video. Hope you all are having a great day, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, wherever the heck you might be. I do hope it is absolutely fantastic. Thank you all once again for watching, listening, commenting, liking. Did I say liking? Subscribing? Subscribe? Did I say that? And or supporting. And I will most certainly be talking to you all soon. See you.